This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. It is a pleasure to be with you today on Getting to Know Your Bible. My name is Billy Lambert. I'm the regular speaker on this telecast, and we'd like for you to stay tuned today as we're going to be talking about Jesus, and, and we're going to be talking about the preeminence of Jesus, the importance of Jesus, the purity of Jesus, and why Jesus ought to be so important to each and every one of us. Please stay tuned. Now today on Getting to Know Your Bible, we're offering a free Bible correspondence course. And I emphasize that it's free, and we want you to have it. And in order that you might know more about the course, know how to receive the course, we're going to pause for just a moment. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible Correspondence Course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580, or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. I'm going to be reading now from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist." And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. You know, there have been a lot of great men and women to have lived on the face of this earth since its beginning people of prominence, people who accomplished great things in life. But the greatest person who's ever lived, who ever walked this earth, was the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to give due consideration to Christ. Rather than neglecting Him, we need to consider Him. As the Hebrew writers wrote in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, For consider Him who endured contradiction of sinners against himself. So we need to give Jesus consideration. And we need to think about how important Jesus Christ really is. Jesus Christ is the most important person who's ever lived. Jesus Christ is the most superior person who's ever lived. Jesus Christ is preeminent over all. As, he, as the writer states in verse 18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So let's think for just a little while today about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Jesus is preeminent in creation. Notice verses 16 and 17, if you will. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, 
and by him all things consist. You know, God's creation is a great marvel. I, I, when you read the account of it in Genesis chapter 1 and over into chapter 2, God is such a wonderful God in the way he created this old earth. But, but Jesus Christ was preeminent in that creation because he was with God in that creation. In, in John's gospel, in John chapter 1 and in verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Jesus Christ, the Word, was with God in the very beginning. God, as it were, planned the creation. Jesus executed that plan. As we'll read here in the Colossian letter, Jesus, all things were created by Him. And they were created for Him. And He says He is before all things. Jesus existed with God in eternity. And before the earth was ever created, Jesus was in existence. He was before all things. And then He says, And by Him all things consist. That simply means that He's upholding all things by the word of His power. Jesus Christ is the one who's holding up the universe. What's causing the earth to spin? Jesus. Well, what's causing the sun, the moon, and the stars to stay in their places in the heavens? Jesus. Well, what's causing the seasons of the year? Jesus. Gee, all things were created by Him and for Him, and Jesus is the one who holds it all together. Jesus Christ is, by Him all things consist. So Jesus Christ was preeminent in the creation of the world. And what a marvelous, marvelous creation it is. When He created man, He made a, a marvel. In Genesis 2 and 7, the Bible says that God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And, and God Almighty created man in his likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And listen to the psalmist in Psalms chapter 8 and verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and a son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him, that is man, a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him, that is man, with glory and honor. Thou hast madest him, that is man, to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet, that's man's feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, all the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Jesus Christ was there with the Father in the creation. He was preeminent in creation. Notice it again. All things were made by him and for him. But Jesus Christ is preeminent in the Bible. Jesus is the theme of the Bible. It's kind of like a scarlet cord running all the way through the Bible. The cross of Jesus Christ and the coming of Jesus Christ is the story of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Someone has said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Well, I know this, that Christ is the focus of the, of the, New, of the Old Testament. In, in Acts the 8th chapter, when Philip came to the chariot side of the man from Ethiopia, he saw that he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the way that our English Bibles are divided, he was reading from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And, and, the, and the prophet asked the man, do you understand what you're reading? He said, well, how can I? unless someone guides me. And so he got up in the chariot with, with the eunuch, and Philip preached unto him Jesus, according to Acts 8.35. Well, what was he preaching? He was using the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. 
But when he preaches Isaiah, he's preaching Jesus. You see, Jesus is the emphasis of the prophecies of the Old Testament. More than 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. And those prophecies have been fulfilled. Jesus said in himself in Luke 24 verse 44 that the things that had been written about him and the law, the Psalms, and the prophets must be fulfilled. He said that those things have to be fulfilled and they were fulfilled. Jesus Christ is preeminent in the Bible. You take Christ out of the Bible and all you have are the, pay, are the covers of the Bible because Jesus is its theme. He is the theme from the book of Genesis to the, book of, to the end of the book of Revelation. Now Jesus Christ is not only prominent in the Bible and preeminent in the Bible. Jesus Christ was, was preeminent in, the re, in redemption. N notice verse uh, number uh, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and tra translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we once were darkness and now we are in the light. We once were blind, but now we see. Now verse 14. In whom, that is Jesus, we have redemption. How? Through his blood. But what's the benefit? Even the forgiveness of sins. And so it is through Jesus Christ, the blessed Son of God, that we have the forgiveness of sins. The fact is, Jesus Christ is preeminent in the entire redemptive process. Someone has said that Isaiah 53 is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Now John 3.16 reads, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But in Isaiah 53 we read, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. And he hath no form, no comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Jesus Christ was wounded, bruised, beaten, slapped, spat upon, all because Jesus was dying for the sins of the whole human family, for, for all mankind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. We should be made the righteousness of God in Him. The only way we could ever be made righteous or right in the sight of God is through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died to redeem the world from sin. And it took His blood. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption. Through His blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of His grace. It's according to the riches of His grace that we have the forgiveness of our sins through His blood. We did not deserve it. Grace is receiving what we need rather than what we deserve. Grace is getting what we need, but we can't get, do it ourselves. There, that, 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 that's not anything that I could ever do. I could never do enough good things to earn God, God's approval so that God would owe me salvation. You see, it's all a matter of grace. It's a matter of the grace of God. It's the unmerited favor of God. There's nothing I can do to merit salvation. It's God's favor. And it was out of His grace that He sent His Son into this world. Titus 2 and 11 says, The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men. And that's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ and His advent into this world. So this whole redemptive process, redeeming people from lostness, 
from sin, from the depths of de degradation and sin is due to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God wants you saved. There's not a single solitary person on the face of this earth that God wants to be lost. First Timothy chapter 2 <laughs> verse 4 says that God would have all men to be saved. Come to a knowledge of the truth. And he said, there's just one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And in due time, Jesus Christ came into this world, lived and died upon that cross, was raised from the dead by the power of God, and descended to the right hand of God. And Jesus Christ became the, the Savior sent into the world, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. Someone says, well, you know, Brother Lambert, I'm a pretty wealthy person. I believe I can buy my way into heaven. I just think that I can buy my way into heaven. You just wait and see. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, verse 19, Peter said, For as much as you know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things. Redeemed means to buy back something, buy back from the devil. You're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. Receive, receive from the vain conversation, that is, conduct of the tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. And that shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the redemption of the human family. That, that's, just, that's just the way it is. You can't buy your salvation. You can't pay God to let you into heaven. If you had all the money that exists in all the world, you could not buy your way into heaven because it takes the blood of Jesus to get you there. This is my blood of the New Testament, Jesus said, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. He shed his blood that our sins might be forgiven. Well, when does that shed blood remit our sins? It's when we as believers in Jesus are willing to repent and to be baptized into Christ. Listen to those who became believers on the day of Pentecost when they asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you by whose authority in the name of Jesus Christ. For what reason, Peter, should we repent and be baptized? For the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so if we want to be redeemed from our sins, we've got to become, we've got to come to the foot of the cross. And let me tell you, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's not just for a select group of people. It's not just for Western civilization. It's for men and women all over the world. And when Peter came to the house over of Cornelius, Cornelius fell down and he, as if he wanted to worship Peter. And Peter said, I want you to stand up. He said, I perceive of a truth that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. I don't care who you are, where you are, what you've done, what you've not done, how much money you have, how much money you don't have, where you live, what kind of car you drive, whether you even have an automobile. It matters not. Jesus Christ loves you. He wants to save you. There are people watching right now who, who have a longing in their heart for Jesus. And I want to urge you to come to the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to urge you to do what the Bible says. I'm not asking you to do what some man says. A lot of men say lots of things that I could not recommend to you. I'll just be honest about that. I could not recommend it to you. And I'm not asking you to repeat some kind of a prayer. I'm telling you what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that to have our sins washed away, they must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. The song, What Can Wash Away My Sins, answers nothing but the blood of Jesus. But notice that song says, What can wash away my sins? What can wash away my sins? You know, it's easy to talk about what other people do. But what about me? The only thing that can wash away my sins 
is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the cleansing agent. And that blood cleanses my sins when I, as a penitent, confessing believer in Jesus, have been baptized. Listen to Acts twenty-two sixteen. 16. The, the man to whom this is said was Saul of Tarsus, the man who persecuted Christians. And he had asked the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, Ananias is going to tell you what to do. Go into the city. He'll tell you what to do. And this is what Ananias told him. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing that, that if we could see a news report on, in the newspaper and on television, hear it on the radio all over the world, people are turning to Christ, believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing they believe in Jesus. They're not ashamed of Jesus. And they're letting some people, some people all over the world are being baptized into Christ. Thousands upon thousands of people turning to Christ. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? It can when we come to the foot of the cross without our preconceived ideas, without our notions, without our, without our biases. We come and accept the cross of Jesus Christ as the answer to the predicament of sin in this world. And this world is eaten up with the rot and the stench of sin. And that's the reason Jesus, the Son of God, went to the cross. You see, redemption is, uh, is because of Jesus. He is preemption, re re preeminent in the redemptive process. But Jesus also is pre preeminent in the church. Notice verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus is the head of the church. We take orders from Jesus. We get our orders from Jesus through His New Testament. That is through the gospel. The church has no place in it for little lords. Elders are overseers or bishops or shepherds in the church. Peter was an elder. And he said in 1 Peter chapter 5, neither as being lords over God's heritage. Elders are not to lord it over the church, but they're to lead the church. There's only one Lord, and that's Jesus. And He is Lord over all, Acts chapter 10 and verse 36. He is Lord over the heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is Lord, and He's our Lord whether we live or whether we die. We are the Lord, Romans chapter 14, verse 7 through verse number 10. And whether we believe it or not, whether we accept it or not, Jesus is Lord. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is preeminent in the church. But let me tell you why Jesus is preeminent in the church. It's because it's His. In Matthew the 16th chapter and verse 18, Jesus said, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's not anything you can do to subvert the will of God. You may reject it. You may not obey it, but you cannot subvert it. You cannot do away with it. You may not pay any attention to it, but you cannot, re you cannot destroy the will of God. And Jesus Christ, the will of God tells us that Jesus Christ is preeminent in the church. And so if He is the head of the church, he is the founder of the church. He is the foundation of the church. It was His blood that was shed to purchase the church, according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Then Jesus ought to be preeminent in the church. Absolutely. Then finally, Jesus is preeminent over death and the grave. Look at verse 18 again. He's the firstborn from the dead that all in all things he might have the preeminence. Je Jesus Christ is the only person that was ever raised from the dead that did not die again. Now Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he had to die again, did he not? And there are others that were raised from the dead. Dorcas was raised from the dead, but she had to die again. And so Jesus is the only one. And Jesus Christ destroyed the stronghold of Satan. 
And he came out of the grave with the keys of death held in the grave in his hand. Revelation 1, verse 18. And I can know that I will live forever because Jesus Christ came out of that grave triumphant over death. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, Paul is talking about the resurrection to come when he says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So then when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be pr- brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And in verse 57 he says, Thanks be to God who gives us that victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because God had the power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, I know that he will have the power to raise all of us from the dead. And the dead in Christ will rise first. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13, reading down through verse number 18. Jesus Christ is preeminent over the grave, and we shall live again. But let me ask you a question. How important is Jesus to you? Is he important in your life? Is he preeminent in your life? Would you not want to make him preeminent today? As a believer in Jesus, would you, would you not be willing to, to give up the life of sin and turn to Christ today and to be baptized into Christ? And once you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It's called the church, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. You're added to the church by the Lord himself. That's what the Bible teaches. May God help us to make Jesus Christ important in our lives. I want to thank you for watching today and in the closing moments. May I encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your community. And if you're not certain where it's located, contact us and we'll give you that information. And and we want to invite you to go. And also pick up the telephone right now. Please, please call for the free Bible Correspondence Course. This is not a gimmick. This is not a, this some kind of a uh, situation where we'll send you a bill. It's absolutely free. And we want to send it to you, please. And, and, and so you can also take this course online. And, but, but until we meet again, may, may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you is my prayer. Getting to know your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214.